Well, I'll try to keep it short and sweet with exhaust systems here. We're going to start off with short stacks. You can see right here, this is one of the first versions of an exhaust system that we use on an aircraft engine. Now, again, why do we spend time talking about this? Well, we lose about 50% of our total heat generated through the exhaust, which means it needs to be a couple things. It needs to support the flow of exhaust gases easily so that we don't have back pressure building up, impeding the volumetric efficiency of the engine. It also needs to be able to stand up to very high temperatures and a lot of vibration, which changes the metallurgical requirements for exhaust system components. In most cases, we're going to use uh, some kind of... Uh, Molly steel, we use ink canal quite a few times, largely for the fact that it doesn't expand as much. Right? These are all fixed. They see a lot of heat, so the more that the exhaust system expands, the more likely it is to cause cracks and breaks. We need a low expansion coefficient, and we need a high ability to transfer heat. Those are really our two big ones. When we look at short stacks, they're great. They do a pretty good job. They look and sound cool. But uh, one downside is whenever that particular stack is not actively expelling exhaust gas, it has a tendency to allow some cold air from the outside to backflow into the exhaust stack, which can then make contact with the exhaust valve, which has a tendency to cause the exhaust valve to warp over time. So that's one drawback. The second drawback, I think it sounds cool. You probably think it sounds cool, but for whatever reason, there's a large group of people that don't seem to like airplane noise as much, and so the excessive noise that comes from short stacks without any kind of muffler is uh, considered a drawback as well. Now, when we look at how we perform this on a radial engine, we'll start with radials first. When we start to collect exhaust and send it out of a single point, on a radial engine, we call that a collector ring. And the idea is we have uh, individual pipes that are coming from cylinders and they're connected by what we call little slip joints right here. That actually allow for some expansion and contraction as well as easier removal of the collector ring. I say easier, that is not to imply that removing a collector ring is ever easy. It is always really, really difficult and something that you want to avoid if at all possible. But that's the way it is. We call that a collector ring. It collects all of the exhaust from the cylinders on the engine and expels it through a single point. On the flip side, with a non-radial engine, horizontally opposed, whatever else we have, the final component in which the exhaust gas is expelled is referred to as a tailpipe. So as it comes out the very end of the exhaust system, whatever we have in between, that is the tailpipe where it is exhausted. As we look at a typical horizontally opposed engine assembly, You'll see that we have two collectors or two manifolds coming from each side of our engine. So we have a six cylinder engine, therefore we have six outputs that are collected to two manifolds which are then collected through a common crossover tube. Now the reason you don't see a tailpipe on this one is because this is actually being sent through a turbocharger. We'll talk a little bit more about turbochargers in just a minute, but this is just a typical system. Again, for ease of installation, ease of replacement, these are going to be broken up into different parts and we have different ways of connecting them together. Slip joints is one. We have these clamps uh, that basically are just little V-clamps that will hold it together. We also uh, use some spring-loaded ball joints, and in some cases, we use bellows to accommodate expansion when the exhaust system heats up. You'll notice on the right side, we have a shroud for cabin heat, so we're going to go back to a somewhat familiar topic in just a minute. Talking about noise, obviously one drawback of short stacks is that it's a little bit too noisy. Again, it's kind of a strange thing, but there has been an epidemic of people in the last 30 years who have moved next to an airport, and they were absolutely shocked to hear how much noise they heard coming from the airplanes. So we keep trying to find ways to make these quieter and quieter to be more pleasant for people on the ground. One way of accomplishing that with small aircraft engines are with mufflers, just like you have on your car. Mufflers are pretty efficient. They do a good job. All we really have is a series of baffles inside of this muffler that are staggered, which forces the sound waves as they enter in to come from the exhaust. It'll bounce around inside on all these baffles, and as a result, we should have diminished noise as it goes and exits out through the tailpipe. That's really all we're looking at. In this case, we have two mufflers, so it's a four-cylinder engine. We have two exhaust ports that are being collected into the muffler, and then the muffler is being sent via a crossover tube to a single tailpipe which exits. 
It's not necessarily the most typical installation you'll see, but it is one of them. In other cases, you may see two pipes that just come directly off of the mufflers on either side. It just depends on how the aircraft was engineered. Now, back to a familiar concept. We talked about the heat muff or the jacket that goes around the muffler on an engine for carburetor heat. Again, this should be somewhat familiar, but we have exhaust coming from the cylinders through the muffler. This heat muff has air that passes around it and is warmed up, and it's ducted via the scat tubing to the carburetor box. When we flip the carburetor heat door to the alternate air position, it allows that hot air to go up through the carburetor and clear up any ice. Under normal circumstances, when the carburetor heat is in cold, that door closes off, the heated air goes overboard, and the inlet air the nice cold inlet air comes into the engine. We can do the exact same thing to provide cabin heat, which is actually really nice. So we have the same arrangement. We have a muff that goes around the exhaust system, typically the muffler. We're gonna have ram air that comes through. It gets warmed up by close contact to the exhaust system. And by this scat tubing, we go up to our cabin heat box. We have a door that is variable to be open or closed. The more it's closed, the more it is going to be deflected overboard, the more open it is, the more of that hot air is going to go into the cabin. Now this does present one particularly sticky issue, which is if for some reason we develop a crack or leak in any part of this exhaust system that is in the section that will be sent out to the cabin for heat, then we're going to send carbon monoxide into the cabin. So the pilot will be flying along, everything's fine, and then all of a sudden they start thinking about apples and cats and fishing lures, and then everything goes dark because they just asphyxiated. We don't want that to happen. So as a result, we have one failsafe by means of a carbon monoxide detector that can be put inside the cabin. This is very cheap, it's very effective. All that really happens is whenever this orange panel is exposed to carbon dioxide, it is going to slowly darken. So if we see a dark spot, as you can see, it equals danger. Don't see a dark spot, that's a bad thing. It will, if it sees carbon monoxide, turn back to its normal color once it's exposed to fresh air. However, because it's a chemical reaction that creates that, it's gonna be a life-limited part, so after 12 months, it must be discarded. That's why we put the date that it is opened and installed on there so we know when that 12 months is up to make sure we aren't flying with a inactive carbon monoxide detector. We look at a slightly more complex system here. What we have is again, exhaust stacks. They're going to a common manifold which are being connected via ball joints to each other and then sent out towards a turbocharger. This is important because if we're using a turbocharger, we're going to collect all of our exhaust gases and use that to power the turbine on the turbocharger. Uh, however, just a little bit of a detail, we have these spring-loaded ball joints. So this is a generic example, but what we have is a metal piece on the inside which is curved. So you'll see it's shaped kind of like that, like a little bit of a ball with the ends chopped off. That provides our flexible joint, and then we have this combination of bolts and nuts with these springs in between that hold tension. The important thing is when this gets installed, you want to be installed so that there is some relative motion that can happen between the two ends. If you tighten it so much that there's no motion, it's not gonna do its job. As this system heats up, this entire length of exhaust pipe is going to expand and contract. As a result, our ball joints can be used to accommodate any angular deflection. However, when we talk about expansion and contraction to keep a seal, what we're really looking at is the slip joint that we have here, which again is pretty simple. If we take a look at a poorly drawn diagram, if this is our outer exhaust pipe, then we have a smaller exhaust pipe that fits inside very tightly. And as we have expansion and contraction, it allows that slip joint to come apart and go back together. In these more delicate areas where we have something like a slip joint where there is potential for leakage though, we're going to incorporate a heat shield to prevent that from potentially radiating any unnecessary heat to components on the engine. Another way that we accommodate this, again, another blow up of that ball joint so you can see a little bit closer, but another way that we can accommodate this is by means of this metal bellows. Now this metal bellows that you see right here does the same job as a slip joint, instead of two pieces that are fit inside of each other, 
we have this entire accordion, effectively, of uh, high temperature metal, which is going to allow for that expansion and contraction. So as we try to make sure that we don't have any issues with uh, fracturing or uh, overstressing due to movement on the exhaust system, we can use the slip joints and our bellows to allow for relative motion without leaking exhaust gases. Now, as we take a look at uh, a couple other things on the exhaust system here, one of the big things is inspection. Now, when we do inspect parts on an exhaust system, there's a couple things we want to look for. If there have been leaks, we can look inside the cowl to tell us the story. In most cases, if we do have a minor exhaust leak, it's going to exit out through the exhaust, and we'll typically see some scorching or soot marks left on the inside of the cowling that can give us an indication that there's been a leak there. That's one of the first things we can look at. Otherwise, as we start to uh, inspect a little bit further, we can start using different methods, one of which is doing a pressure check on an exhaust system component. There's a couple different ways of accommodating this. Uh, if we're testing a muffler, for instance, we can hook up the output side of a shop vac to one side, we can plug the other side with a rubber glove or something that will keep air from coming out, and we can dunk the entire thing underwater to see if we have any air bubbles coming out. You can use a very similar method for testing most exhaust system components. So in a lot of cases, compressed air may be way too much, but a little shop vac isn't too bad uh, if you hook up a hose to the output side. Another option that we have uh, is through visual inspection. Now, one key about visual inspection is we have a number of areas here that are indicated as trouble areas. We're looking at fasteners that hold the muffler jacket on. We're looking at the actual uh, gasket surfaces. We're looking at the plates that get attached to the cylinders themselves. We're looking at the muffler itself, which means it requires the muffler jacket to be removed. If that muffler jacket is not removed, then we won't be able to see if there's any cracks or anything uh, coming apart on the inside. Additionally, when we're looking at the tailpipe, we're looking at any attaching hardware, we're looking for security of installation, we're looking for secure safety wire if that's included, and we're also looking for any cracking or damage that we can see otherwise. One more note, when we talk about the handling of exhaust system components, there's two things we have to be very careful of. Number one, when we're inspecting, if we do have any repairs made to an exhaust system component via welding or anything like that, the welds must be of very high quality. If they are not, if there's any lumpiness or unevenness to it, then it can have a tendency to produce hot spots, which become very, very hot. They can damage other components or cause the exhaust system to melt and blow out in that area, which for that reason, it's highly recommended to send any repairs on the exhaust system that you have that require welding out of your shop to someone who's a professional and can do that the correct way. Another part is whenever we are handling these in the area around galvanized metal, if we have any shielding or other components on the aircraft that are made out of galvanized metal, we have to avoid as much as possible allowing exhaust components to rub or be slammed into galvanized parts. The reason being is that the zinc present in galvanized metal will diffuse into the exhaust system components and can cause it to crack when it's exposed to heat. The same thing goes if we are marking any damage that we observe during an inspection. If we're going to make a note or circle a crack, whatever it is, whatever you do, do not use a lead pencil. The lead pencil, uh, the lead contains carbon. That carbon is going to cause carbon embrittlement on the exhaust system will cause cracking as well. So if you are going to make marks, you can use something like Prussian blue, India ink, grease pen, anything like that, but not a lead pencil because that will cause damage down the road.